Hello, I'm Dady Blake. I'm here with the League of Women Voters. This is our 2016 video voter guide. Uh, we are in Gresham in, at the Metro East Media Center. Uh, this morning I'm here with a uh, someone running for uh, office, um, uh, Timothy Crawley, and he is running for District 48. Um, it's okay if I call you Timothy? That would is that be your fine, preference? Diddy. Thank okay, you. great. Um, Timothy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're seeking this office? Of course. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I grew up in Cottage Grove, Oregon, and so I'm a native Oregonian uh, and, uh, you know, just really uh, came to love this state. I, I spent the first my first 18 years of my life here until I, I graduated from high school. Then I went to school back in Massachusetts for undergraduate uh, schooling uh, at Williams College. I received a bachelor's in economics and studio art and eventually moved back to the West Coast and lived and worked in San Francisco. I spent a, a year with a uh, conflict resolution uh, attorney and uh, one of the founding peacemakers of, of the uh, legal movement and, mm. and conflict resolution. I spent two years at the Federal Reserve, so having a background in economic policy and that was an extension of my undergraduate training. And uh, then I went to law school following that to, uh, three years in law school at uh, the University of California Hastings College of the Law and graduated in 2011 and worked for a Silicon Valley law firm in intellectual property litigation uh, out of Palo Alto. Uh, about a year and a half there uh, before I moved back up to Oregon I, I wanted to establish myself back up in Oregon and establish my legal practice and you know eventually uh, get into politics which has been a dream of mine since I was a kid and I'm running really because I, I love this state okay. I'm living here with my family I have a second baby on the way and and uh, my wife and I live in uh, my wonderful wife I should say who's endured uh, these political races uh, has uh, you know we've we've been living here and and we've come to call Oregon our home and uh, my being a native is a place where I want I have a, a vested interest in the future of our state. Okay, great. And now District 48, um, that roughly is the outer uh, east side Portland. Is that am I saying that correctly? To Clackamas and Happy Valley. Yeah, Happy Valley, okay. Milwaukee, okay. and uh, and yes, the outer portions of of, okay. of uh, southeast. All right. Okay. Well, great. Well, um, if elected. Um, what do you envision as your top priorities for your district? One of the primary uh, issues in our district right now is the um, what we call the housing crisis in Portland. Uh, but it's also, I think, that there's something, there's a little bit of a distinct element to it that has not gotten the attention that uh, it's starting to, mm. but it hasn't gotten the attention in the mainstream media, which is the um, which is uh, the drug issue, um, and that's. Uh, Drug addiction is rampant along the Johnson Creek corridor, uh, the Springwater corridor. I'm on the board of the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I'm also on the board of the Powellhurst Gilbert Neighborhood Association. So, the issues with regard to to drug ad addiction, methamphetamines, heroin, are central to the issue of homelessness out in that area. So, you can't address one without addressing the other. And I think we've gone a little bit housing heavy and haven't necessarily focused on. Uh, attacking the issue from from the standpoint of of mental health and addiction. Right. What causes homelessness? Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the big things before all Oregonians is Measure 97, um, and um, if it doesn't pass, it's it's predicted that there'll be a major budget shortfall for Oregon. Um, how would you address? that shortfall, especially as it relates to some of the social service I issues in education. Absolutely. I think that if it doesn't pass, we need to look at, uh, at, uh, look at a, a funding uh, source, a revenue source that is uh, perhaps uh, found in taking away the mortgage interest deduction. I mean, that's, this is a deduction that could, uh, on the conservative side, bring in $150 million in revenue. Uh, additional revenue from just taking away that uh, that particular deduction. That deduction is very much a uh, a regressive policy. It is a policy that incentivizes uh, that incentiv incentivizes wealth building, and and it's only being able to be taken advantage of by 
uh, those and uh, those with capital. Mm -hmm. So if we take that away, we, we can p potentially bring in $150 million in additional okay. revenue. Okay. Um, turning to gun safety, do you have uh, legislative priorities that would improve gun safety? This has become a, obviously a big issue nationwide, but it's also a big issue for our going as well. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, with Senate Bill 941, which was recently passed, this was a bill that was uh, that required background checks for even private sales of firearms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was a controversial bill that is still very much opposed by a uh, portion of Oregon. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'd like to bring uh, into uh, the position of representative is a is a, a more balanced and holistic approach to the issues. That is not excluding minority voices and minority opinions, uh, or even for that matter, um, voices of the rural community. Uh, that might see uh, an issue differently from uh, those of us in uh, the metropolitan region. Um, so uh, I think what we need to do is with 941, that was a, uh, uh, that was a very, um, um, I, I think, aggressive uh, proposal, which, uh, is, which what we need to do is we need to see that rolled out mm -hmm. and we need to see how it affects and potentially and hopefully reduces gun violence in our communities and then uh, adjust accordingly. I think we need to be cautious about reactionary approaches to uh, to gun safety, particularly with regard to um, you know in dealing with uh, such a uh, an issue that's ingrained in in the in a culture out at least outside mm -hmm. of the metropolitan mm -hmm. region, sure. which you know uh, we're rural guns, Oregon. rural Oregon, yeah, guns are very much a part of that culture and, mm -hmm. and in in their work and livelihoods. So. I think for us to, to legislate, we need to be a little bit more cautious in terms of how we want to respond once Senate Bill 941 uh, rolls out. Okay, all right. Um, in terms of transportation infrastructure, mm -hmm. how can the legislature ensure there are adequate funds to adequately address this infrastructure? Certainly, I you know we've uh, we have a, a a crisis with the ODOT budget right now, mm -hmm. in which they're uh, Essentially, two issues: they're financing their most of their budget is going towards uh, the financing of their projects, that is, paying interest on the projects that, that they've completed, mm -hmm. and uh, the other side of that is just basic maintenance. So there's really not a whole lot of revenue to work with for new projects. Mm -hmm. uh, there is 325 million approximately that will be available under the Obama's uh, President Obama's uh, Fast Act, which is the uh, Fixing America's mm -hmm. uh, Surface Transport Act. Uh, those that that additional funding will uh, likely be conditioned upon a couple of things. One, that the projects that seek the funding will uh, be of uh, of national significance. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, I, the I five, the CRC crossing, mm -hmm. uh, would be an example of that. Um, however, the CRC crossing is not likely to be going forward at least any time in the near future. Uh, but you know, at least in my district, and mm -hmm. I, I know in, in the uh, the district surrounding District 48, there's an issue with the Interstate 205. Mm -hmm. uh, the second component of President Obama's uh, Fast Act uh, has to do with um, uh, freeing up these federal funds for uh, relieving freight congestion. The Interstate 205 is a perfect example of that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, we see congestion happening in the bottlenecks along the freeway along that freeway there. And it would be it was addressed by the 2015 legislature as well, and could be investigated further if an environmental impact statement is prepared, um, and if um, uh, a budget is is completed for a project of of that scope and nature. Then we could see those federal funds being freed up for that kind of thing. Okay, well, I really only have time for a brief addition. Um, if there's something in particular you want voters to know, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to ask you. What do you think sets you apart from the other candidates seeking this position? Well, uh, thank you, Dady. I appreciate the question. It's it's uh, something that I I've, I'm very um, very proud of in terms of my background, and it's and it's my uh, my ability to to resolve conflict. It started just following um, just following my undergraduate education. Mm -hmm. When I moved back to San Francisco, I, I felt I I spent a very formative year with uh, Mr. Harrison Shepard, who's been a mentor and friend of mine uh, over the course mm -hmm. of the last you know, uh, n uh, several years. Uh, and uh, it was during that time where I first became exposed to uh, what it means to efficiently uh, resolve conflict mm -hmm. outside of the, uh, the, le the legal procedures that are inherent in the legal system. Okay. 
Okay. So cutting through a lot of the red tape to uh, find consensus, mm -hmm. to build uh, unity amongst the parties. And I'm, I'm, in addition, I'm running unaffiliated. I'm not running with a party. Okay. That's probably the most important element to what I, I bring to the table. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. I wish we had more. Uh, I want to thank you for viewing and, and remind you that this is a production of a League of Women Voters along with uh, Metro East Community Media. Uh, and uh, remind you to vote November 8th as well as to uh, be sure to register if you haven't already by October 18th. Thank you. <laughs>